listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecki is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Gwilda Wiecki's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Science of Magic or endorsed in any manner by Gwilda Wiecki, Relmar McConnell Media Company, its affiliated networks, stations, or employees. Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome to the Science of Magic, a place where science and magic come together to transform fact into evolving truth. We can be found on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring Continuum. I looked into the eyes of my newborn granddaughter and saw my past and my future. Ancestors and descendants, both in blood and spirit, gazed back at me with the wisdom of the ages. Oh, my, but you came with a mission, didn't you, little one? Don't you remember that didn't go so well for us last time, I whispered to the infant in my dream? Yes, well, I'm here now, so we might just as well get on with it. Besides, this time I came through your matriarchal line. That should make all the difference, the little one responded. So, daughter of my daughter, how can I help you, I inquired. You have it wrong, Grandma. I'm here to help you, she corrected. Opening her tiny fist, she exposed a diamond in her palm that flew out of her hand and into my third eye blasting me out of a dream. I had an ongoing migraine for the next three days, and then the visions began. There's so much more to living than birth, life, and death, yet the trauma of incarnating into this lower-frequency environment creates an amnesia that most of us never transcend. Our placement in the galaxy over the last 12,000-plus years has been in a lower-frequency bandwidth, limiting how much light we're able to bring in. Now, as we re-enter the age of Aquarius, we're coming into a time of greater light. Increasingly, those being born come in with more and more luminosity and therefore wisdom. Some even remember past lives and contracts they chose. 
They're able to see their spirit guides, recognize their ancestors, and the members of their soul team that came to work with them. We all carry what's referred to as junk DNA, deactivated by the long period of lower light. In actuality, it's not junk at all. This inactive DNA is now waking up as more light is present and therefore able to incarnate, resulting in the increasing presence of indigo, rainbow, and crystal children. We tend to think of DNA as a physical aspect that carries genetic markers, which, to a degree, it is. However, at the spiritual or quantum level, DNA serves as a river of light, transcending time and space. Through much processing and willingness to evolve, it's possible for some of us to upgrade our DNA to carry more light as it becomes available. This upgrading enables us to remember who we are, why we came, and the soul teams we came to work with, regardless of when we were born. We tend to think of soul teams, soul mates, spirit guides, and allies as predestined and permanent. Yet that view is a bit limiting. For example, we may encounter a soul mate that we've made an agreement with to come together this lifetime, possibly for the purpose of passing on genetics or taking care of unfinished business. This union may be for a season, not a lifetime, and after we've accomplished what we agree to do, we often find we're poisoning each other's lives to continue to stay together. Throughout my life, I've experienced the ebb and flow of soul teams, and the same holds true. We work together and then move on. Trying to hold on results in, results in incompatibility as our job together is done and another one calls. This is much like cell division. It's also the case with allies, spirit guides, and spirit helpers. The association might be a lifetime or just for a season. Now I find there's members of my soul team that'll probably be with me the rest of this earth walk, as there is enough light present and we've attained enough adequate personal processing to roll up our sleeves, join forces, and get the job done. We decide upon our mission, potential spirit guides, allies, soul teams, and soul mates before each time we incarnate. This choice puts us at the appropriate place on the river of ancestral light carried across the ages by universal DNA. How or if we meet and to what degree we accomplish our chosen missions is left to intent and free will. There is really no predestiny, but rather rivers of probability that we dance each lifetime. Our guest this hour is Ra- Raven Grimasi, the author of Communing with the Ancestors, Your Spirit Guides, Bloodline Alleys, and the Cycle of Reincarnation. After this short break, I'll introduce Raven, and together we'll dance across the ages as we explore reincarnation, allies, spirit guides, and communing with the ancestors. You're listening to The Science of Magic. Prior innovative episodes can always be found on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life is no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. 
As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Wilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Star began to demonstrate a metaphysical connection to the spirit world as a little girl. Her family noticed the connection, but it was a great-grandmother who told the family that Linnea was indeed gifted. The great-grandmother, who was also gifted, felt that Linnea had indeed inherited these attributes. It has been noticed that oftentimes, such things are passed down through the generations. Linnea was also born with a call, a thin white membrane across a newborn's face. Legend has it that if the baby is born with this call, the child will have second sight, or what we call psychic abilities. Linnea Starr does past, present, and future, and has the gift of prophecy. It is written within scriptures that if you are able to give factual information, and prophecies indeed come true, the gift indeed comes from the divine realm. Linnea Starr does large interactive groups as well as private gatherings. For more information on Linnea Star or to contact Linnea for a one-on-one consultation, visit her website at www.linneastar.com. That's www.l-i-n-n-e-a-s-t-a-r.com. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Raven Gramasi, author of Communing with the Ancestors. Raven is a practicing witch and an award-winning author of over 20-plus books on witchcraft, Wicca, magic, and inner mysteries traditions. He brings to the table over 45 years of personal experience, study, and in-depth understanding of these fields. It's his life work to preserve the roots of pre-Christian European spirituality and mystical themes. Visit Raven's website at www.houseofgramassi.com. Raven, thank you so much for joining us on The Science of Magic. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. I've been looking forward to this. Would, would you mind clarifying what you mean by the ancestors? Well, the ancestors... Um Perhaps at some point we'll get into the difference between the dead and the ancestors, but the ancestors are the ones who came before us who, um, in sort of what was passed to me, the idea is they are uh, either have reached the end of a reincarnation cycle or the need for reincarnation itself, um, but they can um, reincarnate um, you know, if there's a particular reason to do so. Um, so it's a little bit different, but the ancestors would be those from a long time ago who no one living today personally knew. Okay, so you say the ancestors are between the earth plane and the elemental plane. Would you explain these differing planes and how they work there? <laughs> sure. Well, of course, you have the material plane, which is you know the lowest vibration in which thoughts become things and material forms. But if you back up sort of reverse engineering the plane before that, the dimension or reality before that would be elemental, made up of the etheric properties that constitute the process of manifestation. So the ancestors, because they were 
part of the material plane, they still have ties directly to the land, the spirit of the land and materialism itself, but they're really not material anymore. So they're sort of in between the plane that is material and the plane of the elements, the four elements which constitute the process of making things material. And that kind of gives them influence over reincarnation itself, the idea of bringing something non-material and making it manifest in the material plane. So they're sort of in between those two realms and they mediate that process. So these would be what my uh, Native American teachers would have called the old ones, I believe. Um, And is the elemental plane then kind of like the quantum level? Well, yeah, certainly I would I would say I don't think it really anything's outside of the quantum level, but <laughs> yeah, it would be, you know, the probabilities and possibilities, that whole idea of wave and particle interaction. Well, now you've got me intrigued. So what do you see as the difference between the ancients, <laughs> the ancestors, and the uh, ones that are dead? Well, the dead, uh, I guess we'll start with that. The dead are um, those who someone today in the world knew personally. As long as there's a living person who knew the departed, there's a etheric connection that keeps the dead and the living in relationship. But once that, um, once no one in the current living uh, generation knew the departed, then that dead person slips into the ancestral realm. So that's the difference really, that the dead are in a realm connected to the living because they're still remembered by someone who personally knew them, whereas the ancestors, there isn't anyone living who actually knew them. So there's a a separation. It's a little bit different communicating with the ancestors and with the dead. The ancestors um, are beings that are of your lineage line. They go back to the very beginning, so they are um, what I call flowing within the ancestral uh, river of blood through each generation to us. Um, we, each of us today, is the living steward of that bloodline lineage from our ancestors. So we have a role or a position as steward um, of that. Now, the ancients, you brought up that term. I, I suppose we would need to define that because people probably think, you know, differently about what ancients are. Um, to me, the ancients would be a broader category, um, maybe not even related per se. You know, I can think of I have ancestors, but then there's also ancients who lived in those different time realms who I have no bloodline connection to, but perhaps a soul connection to. That That's sort of how I would try to sort it out. Okay, so the etheric connection, would you go into that a little more for me? Are you saying that the um, um, as long as someone is remembered, that kind of holds them to this plane in a different way than if they're not? Yeah, um, what was passed to me is that um, the living, just by our our life energy in and of itself, as long as we knew someone who has departed, we maintain, I guess what the shaman kahunas in Hawaii would call the Aka cord. We maintain a direct connection to them. So there's there's communication and contact. They visit in dreams, you know. I mean, there's there's an ongoing active element there. Whereas with the ancestors, it's not active in that way because we didn't really know them. Like, I don't really know who my great-great-great-great-great-grandfather was. But there's a connection through my DNA and the living river of blood to that entity, to that being. But it has to be activated. I I have to nurture it. I have to work with it. But with the dead, I don't because the cord is automatically connecting us all the time. I'll feel them. I dream about them, I communicate with them, I give them offerings of food and drink. I have an active, ongoing relationship with them, um, which is a little bit different than the ancestral um, connections that I have. What are the benefits or purpose behind communicating with the ancestors and making them a part of our daily lives like you do with the dead? Right. Well, you know, with the dead, they're still pretty much who they were when they departed. Whereas the ancestors have sort of grown in a collective consciousness. So communicating with them, um, they can actually lend us their collective experience. So when we are in a dilemma, in a situation, even in a healing, a need for healing, the ancestors can draw upon the collective knowledge 
of healing techniques that save them, um, situations that got them out or may help them master, you know, something that we may be in ourselves today. So we can turn to the ancestors as allies and they can give us their collective wisdom of how they dealt with that situation. Whereas the dead, not so much because the dead really still are kind of who they were in life and they haven't really evolved as have the ancestors. So even though the dead can give us advice and, and work with us, they're not really coming from a greater collective knowledge. They're coming from personal gnosis. Um, but when you add personal gnosis, you know, times tens of thousands of ancestors, well, then you've really got something to draw upon. How does that differ from the what some people call the Akashic Records? Well, I think the Akashic Records are sort of impersonal. You know, they're just a kind of a record of the energetic exchanges here. Um, in the tradition that I practice, we, we have a a concept that we call the organic memory of the earth or what we call shadow. And our feeling is that every living thing that walked upon the land that died, its essence and, and material form went into the soil and soil is made up of minerals and minerals are crystals. So those crystalline forms are holding those memories. So it's kind of a, a European counterpart if you think about it to the idea of the Eastern me uh, metaphysical idea of acoustic records, which is sort of, memory held in the ether of the earth, the energy around the earth, whereas shadow memory is actually in the land itself. Our feet are directly touching it all the time. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Um, it's more organic, um, the memory of the earth, than the Akashic records. But the Akashic records, these are just sort of, I hate to use the word impersonal because it sounds demeaning, but it, it isn't active. It isn't aware of us if that makes any sense. We have to tap into it. So it's not interactive like you would see the ancestors as being. Are the ancestors like one step closer to unity than the dead? Is that what we're looking at here, is the progression towards oneness? Um, I wouldn't argue with that. I, I've never really played that through. Um, but yeah, I would have to say that would, that would be, they would certainly be closer to that than, than the dead would be, certainly. I was really intrigued by something you call, refer to as spirit rider. Would you mind telling us a little mm -hmm. bit about that? Yeah, that's fascinating, and, and I've been working a lot with that since uh, completion of the book. It's a concept that arose when I was doing some research um, for the book, and I ran across two concepts, one in the uh, ancient Hawaiians. They had a, a technique where the shamans would sort of go down the spinal cord and out the tailbone, trying to uh, go backwards in time to connect with an ancestor. At the same time, I ran across a Mayan teaching in which the, uh, it's called a serpent, a uh, vision serpent. Um, and in this, the um, shamans would burn some um, wood or bark that they had anointed with their own blood. And as the smoke rose from that, a vision serpent would appear and an ancestor would walk out on the tongue of the serpent. So this idea of the serpent was really being channeled to me, you know, through the ancestral communication. And one night I was given a vision, kind of a combination of an ancestor coming as a spirit form in the shape of a serpent. And that that serpent went up and nestled in my spine. And when it did, it had an eye in its mouth and the eye and the head of the snake came out my forehead. And the spirit said to me, I am a, your spirit rider, and I can carry you, connect you, journey with you. And so I started this idea of working with a cord that is the length from, of my spine, and um, I sort of put it on me and hold it, and that becomes the spirit rider that I call from my ancestors to invite an ancestral um, consciousness directly into um, the, my body. And what was interesting is uh, I used to refer to, you know, we've all had this idea, I think most people call it the um, a chill of affirmation, you know, when you have something said Wait, or I'm read, you read something. Or, pause this and hmm. leave, as, as one of my friends would say, leave it as a cliffhanger because we have to take a oh. break. <laughs> we'll pick up with the subject okay. on the other side. 
We'll return to our discussion after this short break. You're listening to The Science of Magic. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Do you want to hear more? Previous broadcasts of innovative episodes can always be found on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Thomas Jefferson was a Burgess of 27 when he met Martha Whale Skelton, a 22-year-old widowed heiress who was fondly called Patty by her family. They were married on January the 1st, 1772, and they took up residence in a cabin on the building site on top of a Virginia mountain that Thomas had named Monticello. As Thomas and Patty slowly built their first version of the great house at Monticello, the Revolutionary War was heating up. Patty, with difficulty, bore five children, but only two girls survived. Thomas's political career developed to the point where he was often away from home, but after he authored and signed the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, he resolved never again to leave his wife. He was elected the governor of Virginia, just as that state became the revolution's last battleground. The Revolutionary War ended in 1781, and Thomas gladly retired altogether to my family, my farm, and my books. But Patty continued to want to bear her treasured husband a son, and late in the summer of 1782, she died of kidney failure at the age of 33, four months after having borne yet another girl. Thomas was so devastated by her death that he never remarried. He mourned her for the rest of his life, even as he helped to frame the peace in France and then became the first Secretary of State, the second Vice President, and the third President of the United States. This story is true. Thomas Jefferson was such an obsessive letter writer and record keeper that we know where he was and what he was doing nearly every day of his adult life. Every significant thing he says in My Thomas comes from his contemporary writings. My Thomas by Roberta Grimes is now available at Barnes & Noble, Costco, Target, Books A Million, Hudson Booksellers, Kmart, Walmart, Sam's Club, Walgreens, CVS, and online at Amazon.com. You can visit Roberta Grimes online at www.robertagrimes.com. <laughs> The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. 
Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Unwilling to be the government's deadly assassin, gifted psychic Kahara Mitchell went AWOL and ended up buried under rubble in the wake of a great tsunami. She regained consciousness far from Earth on the medical ship of a Dagaronian intergalactic fleet. Has she been rescued or abducted by aliens? The Chalice of Carrie, Kahira O'Donnell's latest paranormal science fiction romance, is the passionate story of an Earth woman and her destined mates, twin kings from another galaxy. Kahara uses her gifts fighting alongside Lords Rom and Ra in a war that will determine the destiny of galaxies. The Chalice of Kari by Kahira O'Donnell is now available at kahiraodonnell.com or at amazon.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Annie Callahan, dedicated to negotiating a position for Earth within the Dagaronian coalition, had trained for three years to become an Earth ambassador. Yet, the very eve of her arrival at the capital ruling planet, she is claimed as destined mate to an oversized, mating maddened vamp who swears he will never release her. Lord Astaran, king of the Macian sector, has waited over 900 years for his destined mate, Having found her as an alpha vamp, he is unable to relinquish Annie, virtually holding her hostage until he can claim her. Yet Macians cannot survive without their mate's love. How could he strip her of her citizenship, her ambassadorship, and her freedom and expect to win her heart? With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is the latest book in this exciting series, The Daggeronian Chronicles, guaranteed to keep readers coming back for more. With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is available on Amazon.com and KahiraO'Donnell.com. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. Visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wayaka. Our special guest this hour is Raven Grimasi, the author of many fine books, including his latest, Communing with the Ancestors. His website is www.houseofgrimasi.net. 
www.spiritwriter.com. We were doing a cliffhanger, so to speak, about mm. the Spirit Rider, and I'd really like to go further into this. I, it was fascinating to me because I've studied a lot of different shamanic traditions, and I see mm. that snake in so many of them, uh, clear back to Egyptian. Um, and yet this came to you as a personal uh, spirit helper, is that correct? Well, it came to me in a vision of how to connect with that, that the ancestors can can come to you in spirit form and align with your spine. Our spines look very much like snakes. And it, it sort of um, like attracts like energy, and it goes right in. You can feel it sort of move up into the spine. And as I was saying before the break, um, I used to use the term chill of affirmation when you would get sort of that tingling up your spine. But when I used it after working with the technique, the ancestors actually said to me, stop using that term because what really is happening, that sensation, is the spirit rider sort of snuggling deeper into the spine um, to bring awareness to you, to, to get you to pay attention to the moment you were in. Um, so I use that now. I, I say the spirit uh, rider has wiggled instead of saying the chill of affirmation. But it's a technique that I use to consciously draw uh, a spirit writer to me, and I can go into the past with it or into the future with it or just hone down, you know, more in, in the present. But what I was saying earlier is that the spirit writer, when it comes, it has an eye in its mouth, and that is the ancestral eye. And the first thing it does is it looks out through your forehead into the world that we have created, or the descendants have created, and it sees what has come. And then if it'll turn around and look at you with that eye, and then you go down actually the serpent, you go down the serpent and out and back into the ancestral realm where you can see their realm in the past. So past and present join together through the spirit writer, and it's a very profound feeling. And then you can look into the modern world with ancient eyes, and um, it's really very, very beneficial and it's so important, you know, it's because each of us really is the living steward of our bloodline. Um, there's a lot of power and responsibility in that because we are the current keeper of that river of blood. And the ancestors have a vested interest in the living because as long as we live, their, their lineage continues. That's pretty amazing. So let's go a little bit further into how their lineage continues as long as we live, if they've really kind of disconnected. Uh, why is that important, do you think? Well, they haven't really disconnected. I mean, they've always been within the living river of blood. They're within our cellular memory. Um, it's just the communication hasn't been what it used to be. Um, but as long as there are people that are living, um, the way it was passed to me is that just as a person has a purpose in life or a goal in life or something they need to achieve, so do, so do the ancestors. They have a, a need for their lineage, that nationality, bloodline lineage, to complete a mission that was the goal of that bloodline to begin with. So each generation has an agent of the ancestral bloodline. So you and I, for example, are agents of our, of our lineage line, our bloodline back to the past. It is a, a role that we take on to further the progress of the ancestral mission. So part of spirit contact with the ancestors is to find out what is that mission? What is it I need to do on your behalf? That's part of why we're here. We're not simply here just for our own spiritual evolution. We have a greater mission to accomplish, which is bringing the whole lineage forward so that the, the future continues in the process so that things like reincarnation are possible because people are still here. Would you go into how the, the ancestors participate in this reincarnation process? Yeah, that was fascinating. Um, what was passed to me, and, and I'm going to have to be simplistic, I'm afraid, so it may sound a little bit hokey, but the idea is that the ancestors are the ones who actually create the human body. They actually bring the elements to bear to create a physical form that the soul can inhabit. They also generate human consciousness. So what happens is the, our souls have a need for reincarnation. They have a, a need for a physical body, um, what I call the deep sea diving suit of the soul, to explore the material realm and to learn the lessons that only material reality can teach a soul. 
So the soul needs a body, and the ancestors need um, a an, an agent to further their bloodline. So an agreement is struck between the ancestors and the soul. The ancestors say to the soul, I will provide you with a body um, so that you can do what you need to do, and you animate that body, and through that body, the human consciousness that I instill within it will be my agent um, to further that. So it's kind of a a joint mission in which the ancestors provide the physical form, the soul animates that form, and together both get what they need, the soul getting its evolutionary experience through the teachings of material reality, and the ancestors getting an agent who will further the mission of the bloodline. So it's like a mini mission within a larger one. It is, yeah, very much so. And a whole bunch of people and ancestors participating at the same time. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, sure, through various lineages, through various bloodlines. Um, you know, and then we also have, um, you know, the soul and its soul memory, which is memories of life forms uh, being, I'm sorry, lifetimes that had nothing to do with the, with the blood lineage they're in now. Uh, in fact, the ancestors passed to me the idea of the, one of the problems with past life recall is the ancestors are saying it's very difficult to discern when you do past life, is was that one of your past lives you're remembering, or are you remembering a past life of your own lineage that it wasn't you, but it was your ancestor who's still within your 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 blood, speaking from the cellular memory. So they were saying it's it's difficult to sort out what was your personal memory, which is what versus what was an ancestral memory. I'm so glad you said that because you know when in my practice. People will oftentimes ask me for a past life regression, and right. I kind of hesitate unless that's where the healing has to happen because I find people can become so enamored with who they think they've yeah. been in past life that they <laughs> identify to a point of detriment. Have you found that? I have, and um, I have never really been a big advocate of past life regression unless there was great trauma that needs to be resolved. You know, I think our past lives are our past lives. I think our present life is more important to focus on. Because the mission is now, yes? The mission is now, yeah. And it can be confusing. Like, you know, over the years, I mean, I've met probably a dozen different people who told me they were Aleister Crowley in their past life. You know, <laughs> there, there's something wrong there. <laughs> exactly. You know. Multiple personality disorder is <laughs> yeah. finest, right? <laughs> well, he may, yeah, he may have had multiple personalities, but, you know. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so I think that, yes, I, I think our mission is now. And uh, I think that while past lives can be interesting, I don't know that in, unless there's trauma that needs to re, be resolved, I don't know that they're really all that important to remember. Because it's pretty unclear as to whose it is in the first place from what you were saying. Is that correct? Yeah, it can be. It can be. So why not focus on who you are now and what you need to accomplish and, and, and move with that? I think that that's a, a more effective use of our time. Beautifully put. So, how um, what do you see spirit guides as in this in this equation, or do you? Um, well, I think there's there's a whole body of spirit guides, and I think the ancestors are part of that. They certainly uh, constitute spirit guides, um, but I think there's other entities that come around um, that are associated you know, maybe with the dead, for example, the entities that they're connected with who are mentoring them in the realm of the dead. And I think that they all have a vested interest in us continuing on as a species. Um, so they're all there to, to help from their perspective, and they do lend that, that spirit eye. You know, they have a higher perspective than... Whoops, it looks like we're out of time for this segment. We're going to pick up on that on the <laughs> other side. We'll be back on the flip side of this short break. You're listening to The Science of Magic, the place where altruistic professionals of science and the esoteric create common ground for the betterment of our world. You can always listen to previous broadcasts on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net.
children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500-plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at Songs and Stories for Soul. Soldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. If you enjoy reading a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love From Out of the Woodwork by William S. Peckham. Sean Kennedy, a Toronto contractor, buys derelict houses, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, a century house in ruins, and starts the renovation... The house fights back. He is visited by ghosts of owners past. His visions are triggered by touching an oak mantle, reading a faded letter, opening an old locket, or opening a brand new casket in the basement. These visions will take you on a trip across southern Ontario from Niagara Falls to Toronto to Kingston. From Out of the Woodwork is now available in paperback and on your favorite electronic reader. To order your copy of From Out of the Woodwork, go to www.williamspeckham.com. That's www.williamspeckham.com. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, bringing together gifted people of service to the world. Our website is www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Raven Gamaski, award winner, author of more than 12 books, including his latest, Communing with the Ancestors. His website, www.houseofgramasi.com. Raven, what are bloodline allies? Well, the bloodline allies are really a combination of, of the dead and the ancestors. They are um, uh, the dead being dead relatives. Um, they are contained within the living river of blood. This came up one night. I was having a conversation with a fellow occultist, and we were talking about the dead. And he said, where do you suppose the dead are? And he said, you know, there's all these ideas of the underworld and other world experiences and And he said, do you know where I think they are? And I said, where? And he said, they're in our cellular memory. They're actually in our blood. The underworld is actually within us physically. Um, So these are your bloodline allies that you can, through blood work, um, connect with directly on a much more intimate level. Um, Today, people are, some people are kind of squeamish about the idea of using blood. Um, You know, but we, we bleed in so many mundane ways. You know, why not also bleed in sacred ways? Um, so in my tradition, what we do is if we, you know, like prick our thumb, squeeze three drops of uh, blood out from the uh, thumb into a, a glass of water, and we offer that to our bloodline allies, 
and our ancestors and the dead. Um, it, it harkens back to an ancient idea um, that shows up in ancient literature in which um, there's one particular tale in which a hero is sent to the underworld to connect with a dead person who has the information they need. And there's a witch that sends them there, and she tells them, when you get there, you must offer some of your blood in a drink to the dead. And when they taste the blood, they will remember life. And when they remember life, they will remember who they were in life. And when they remember who they were in life, they will remember how to speak again. So this is the idea of this communication through the bloodline. That makes perfect sense to me because it's a thing of frequency, isn't it? It is, absolutely. Like attracts like also. And so there's crystalline forms in our, in our blood, and it, the frequency is remembered there? Um, I would agree with that. Yeah, I hadn't really thought that in that way, but yes, that makes sense. It, all, it just all comes together. It's so fun to watch. Um, before we <laughs> run out of time, Raven, uh, would you mind telling people where they can find your books? Well, they should be available really in any you know, well-stocked bookstore. Um, they certainly are available through Amazon.com and also through my wife's um, website, ravensloft.biz, B-I-Z. Um, all of my books are there. And the advantage of going through her shop is that you can have the books autographed if you like. So there's, there's that sort of uh, thing as well. But it should be uh, easy to find. Well, that's good to know. How many do you have out there? Um, I have about... 21 books, I guess, at this point in print. I thought you had quite a few. You just have an amazing yeah. piece of knowledge, and I can't thank you enough for sharing it with us today. So what's your take on soul teams, soul mates, soul contacts, and past life connections? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to hit well, a curve right here at the end. Yeah, that's quite a smorgasbord uh, laid out there. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Um, soul mates. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, I do think that there are, um, you know, I think that souls travel in tribes. And I think we reconnect with key people in those tribes. And uh, there are some who we really have a very strong bond to and maybe unfinished business. And so we meet again and and we 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 get further along the process of helping each other in evolution. So I do believe in, in soulmates. Although I think that people kind of use that term a little lax um, because there's like some, some people just think that everything is a soulmate, you know, they're cat, they're canary, you know, everything. Um, <laughs> but I think that soul, soul, <laughs> I think that soulmates are probably a little bit more profound in the coming back together, you know, in, in human form. Um, the, I forgot what else you asked me now. Oh, that's okay. I had a big old list there, but I think you pretty well covered it. Um, <laughs> I guess the con, you know, soul contracts is kind of what you were talking about is the missions, and that was the other thing I asked about. Yeah, soul contracts, and 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 this is the thing. You know, I I'm one who does not believe in in predestination. I think that there are many probabilities. I don't believe in fate per se. Although I do think there are key things that we see in the soul contract when we're souls, given the opportunity to have a life through the ancestral bodies that will be supplied to us. Um, I think in that time we can see, you know, will I be married? You know, will I have children? Will I be rich or poor? Uh, healthy, you know, um, handicapped? I think these are things that probably are, are foreseen, but they don't have to be. I think they're likely to be, and we take them on. But, for example, you know, so many people say, oh, that was meant to be, you know, whatever happens. And I don't think that that's always true. You know, for example, you're walking down the street and somebody drives by and shoots you. Um, that was certainly their free will to do that. Was that fated? You know, I'm not sure it is. I, I, I think that all of us have free will. And that free will is being exercised all the time. Um, so it's difficult for me to sort out what would be destiny you know, in, in a situation like that versus what's just this idiotic moment this person had who shot you, you know. Um, I, I don't think it's so black and white. I, I think that there's other levels going on there. But I do believe there are probability points at which something's very likely to happen to you. And it, it may or may not, depending on your choice. 
You know, for so, example, we all have that inner voice that will say, you know, don't go down the street or don't get in this car with these people. If you ignore that, you know, then you've stepped outside of what would have been a different timeline in your life. Um, but you had the choice. It was a pivotal moment. Was it fated? You know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I just am not a big, strong believer in fate per se. I, I love the way you're putting that because I'm, I'm kind of on the same page with you there. I think we make our own fate within the, the um, soup of life, if you will. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you have anything you'd like to share with our listeners in closing? Well, um, yeah, I, one thing I would like to say is that it, this, this idea of the ancestors is so important because they're speaking louder and louder all the time because through us they're seeing what we have done to the world that was once their purity world. And they want to help us turn the tide of destruction. And so through the ancestors and their collective wisdom, we can turn the tide. This is the message they keep telling me. We can turn the tide. Um, in my own tradition um, that I practice, we, we connect with uh, the, the spirit of the land and the greenwood spirits, and they talk about the tenacity of life. You know, the greenwood spirits are always telling me, hey, look at any city sidewalk or street covered with your state-of-the-art cement and asphalt, and you'll see a crack in it, and in that crack you'll see a green thing growing, because the greenwood life is tenacious. And one time they asked me, the, the spirit said, why does your kind spend so much time prophesizing your own doom? Why are all your movies and stories about the end? Do you not know where you live? The cycle of the earth is about life, birth, death, and renewal. When did you ever get the idea that this ends in destruction? And I think that's so important for us to remember. It is about life, birth, death, and renewal. And the ancestors want us to get back living in common cause with the earth like they did. We can turn beautiful, the tide with beautiful that. Beautiful words of wisdom. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Raven, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. This has been the Science of Magic. Remember, you can always listen to past thought-provoking episodes on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. Until next time, dear ones, may you be blessed with knowledge, comforted with love, as you navigate your rivers of probability. Searching through